<laughs> yeah. Not too bad though. Uh, very straightforward. So everything that I've asked has been done in the class. Okay, so if you have attended the classes, uh, you probably will be able to do everything in 10 minutes. <laughs> Excuse me? You want us to prove that the simplest method converges? Oh, no, 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 none of that, no, no, no. If it takes more than two sentences to solve problem, let's say, 2A, then, I'm, then you are doing something wrong. Okay, it should be, you should be able to write the solution in two or three sentences for every part. Okay, and there are four questions. <laughs> there are four questions. Problem one has no parts, two has no parts. 3 has 2 parts and 4 has 3 parts. Okay, so only you have to write a total of 15 sentences <laughs> in the entire answer sheet. Okay, so yeah, it's so theoretical, it's proof based, but it's short. It's very short. Okay. Yeah. So you have to spend more. See, one of the things that I, I did not like when I was uh, an undergrad was to take examinations where thinking is two minute job and writing is 20 minute job. So I always try to create problems where thinking is, takes far more time than actually writing it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know, yeah. I don't know, we'll find out. Yeah. Okay. So we'll continue our discussion on Lagrange multiplier theorem today. And the first thing that I want to do is solve another problem using Lagrange multiplier theorem before we jump on to sensitivity theorem. So remember this problem of finding a projection. So minimize half x minus c square uh, ax equal to 0. So this is something that that we did uh, in one of the classes earlier, but we didn't really come up with a solution. We just said, look, here is a solution that has been proposed by the author, and that solution seems to satisfy all the conditions for being a projection, okay? So that was not constructive. And now we want to solve this problem using a constructive approach uh, in order to find the projection x star, okay? All of you remember this projection problem? Okay, we didn't really cover the proof of how to get x star uh, last time when we touched upon this problem. So let's uh, try and do it this time. So step zero, uh, is it regular? So gradient of h of x is actually a transpose and this is gradient of h of x is regular, or not, not gradient, the point x is regular, x is regular because uh, a is full rank. Okay, so all the columns of a are linearly independent. That h again uh, that that H is just the set of constraints, um, yeah. And so the, the gradient of H is just a transpose. The of that. Yeah, okay. yeah. The gradient so H of X is A multiplied by X. A is a matrix in R M times N. M is strictly less than N. Okay, so this is like a subspace. h of x equal to 0, passing through the origin. Okay, so x is regular because a is full rank, that's my assumption. Now step one, I need to construct the Lagrangian, so L of x comma lambda is half x minus c transpose x minus c plus lambda transpose AX. Because that's F plus yes. lambda H. Yes. This is my F. This is my H of X. 
and that's my Lagrangian. Okay, and then what's the next step? Take the derivative with respect to x. Okay, so I want to find the gradient of the Lagrangian. Oh, actually, it's x minus c plus a transpose lambda. Okay, so what happens at the optimal point? The Lagrangian, the gradient of the Lagrangian becomes zero. At the optimal point x star and the corresponding Lagrange multiplier lambda star. So that would give me This implies that x star is c minus a transpose lambda star. Okay, so what's the next step? H x star equals to zero, right? So H of x star equal to zero. This means A multiplied by C minus A transpose lambda star is equal to zero. This means A C equals to A A transpose lambda star which further implies that lambda star is equal to a a transpose inverse a c <coughs> okay and now i am going to substitute this lambda star here to get x star, so I get x star equals to c minus a transpose a, a transpose inverse a c. Okay, or i minus That's the proof. <coughs> okay, what is missing right now? Okay, I, I want all of you to write it, stare at the board for some minutes and find a missing step. What's the miss? Sorry? I hear some murmuring, but I can't really figure out what people are speaking. Okay. Sorry? Strictly optimized? Okay. So, second order sufficient condition, right? So, that's step three. Second derivative of L is actually identity. Right, the first derivative is x minus c plus a transpose lambda. Then you take the derivative with respect to x. This is zero. This one goes zero. All you are left is x. Derivative with respect to x, and so that's equal to identity. So, second order sufficient condition is satisfied.
Okay, so this is indeed the optimal solution. Oh, uh, that's a good point. You know, there is one more way that's given in the book. I can't really construct the solution right on top of my head. But what the book suggests is if you have a plane and you have a point here in the space, the, on the only way to project this point onto this plane is to make sure that you are making a right angle with some point uh, y in this subspace. Uh, it turns out that all the normals to the surface are actually given by A transpose mu for some appropriate values of mu. Um, but you still need to find what y would be, right? Only then, oh yeah, so you need to find y such that y plus A transpose mu is going to be equal to C. Uh, but I, I don't know how to find y. I mean, that's not useful because I don't know what mu is. Well, that, that sounds to me a little bit more like the, the geometric proof. Yeah, that's a geometric proof, but uh, yeah, but you still need to find mu. <coughs> okay. What would be another way? No, I, I don't think I can come up with another way because ever since I've learned KKD, can, like these Lagrange multiplier theorem, I've forgotten everything else. <laughs> well, <and then laughs> I studied in optimization. Right? Yeah. Uh, steepest descent and right. uh, constraint optimization. And, uh, and the, here's a constraint optimization problem, and yet for some reason we have to use the range multipliers right. to solve it. Right. <coughs> yeah. Okay, any question? Yes? Uh, I want to ask why A transpose, A, A transpose inverse A is not an equal identity. So remember that A is, a, is not a square matrix. Okay, it's a, yeah. Okay, any other question? Yeah, okay. So this is another instance where you could use Lagrange multiplier theorem to prove these results pretty quickly. I mean, of course, right now it's taking a lot of time because once you get used to it, you'll recognize when you are seeing a set where all the points are regular, so you don't really need to worry about regularity. And then you just construct the Lagrangian, get the first derivative, plug in the value here to get the value of x star, and then check the second order sufficient conditions. Right? So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the next topic is sensitivity theorem. And I want to motivate the discussion from some problems in economics. And here is the question. Let's say you are, you are a manufacturer you, manu you manufacture something, like let's say you manufacture, oh yeah, there's a question. Uh, this might be a silly question, but... Uh, Nothing is silly. In, this, in, this, in the proof that we did, we showed that x star is optimal solution for the Lagrangian. No, we, so by the Lagrange multiplier theorem, x star is an optimal solution to the original constraint problem. So remember we talked about the sufficient conditions. Yeah. So we said that if x bar and lambda bar satisfies some conditions, then x bar is an optimal solution to the original optimization problem and lambda bar is the corresponding Lagrange multiplier. So that means we can convert any constraint optimization problem into a Lagrangian and solve it and we get the same solution? Yes, you are right. And that's what most of the Lagrange multiplier based uh, optimization algorithms essentially tries to do. So we, we don't need any method for constraint optimization, just convert it to Lagrangian and solve it. 
yes we will we will exactly do that for the next i don't know two weeks okay yeah uh it's conceptually much easier okay uh you know he he just mentioned this point that what we are essentially trying to do is finding a minimum for the lagrangian specify that lambda star now in a general problem you wouldn't know what lambda star is so in some sense you will have to update your lambda case such that lambda case converts to lambda star and your x case converts to x star okay and we will certainly study some of those some such algorithms in the next two weeks three weeks and so it makes it conceptually much easier to solve such problems does this only work for equality constraint or inequality we will talk about equality inequality constraint as well today okay um i i i'm 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 assuming we'll have enough time to talk about inequality constraint uh so <coughs> sensitivity theorem okay so you are a pen manufacturer okay and you manufacture 1 million pens every year and i come to you and i ask you that i want just one pen okay i want to buy just one pen and in order for you to manufacture so you are already manufacturing 1 million pens okay but in order to manufacture 1 million and 1th pen you need to spend 2 dollars okay and that 2 dollars is essentially the cost of the material the cost of labor the cost of equipment or wear and tear and so on How much will you ask me to pay for that one million and one th pen? Okay, that's the question. What do you think should you be charging me for selling me this pen? Any thoughts? Okay, it's a philosophical question. Yeah. So, so the the uh, the cost of all the pens added up because it can be different. Yes. For the first pen. Yes. And same with like pharmaceuticals, the first pill is the first right. cost. The That's right. That's right. Dollars. That's right. That's and, right. And so we divide that by uh, the number you're going to sell, mm -hmm. and then and multiply by one plus your profit margin. Let's say profit margin is zero. I don't care about the profit margin. Then I'm going to charge you the average cost of yeah. one million and one pen. Yeah. Okay. But remember that the average cost could be much lower. than 2 dollars right because typically what happens is in order to make the first 1000 pen you don't have to invest too much in order to get 10000 pens every year you need to invest a little bit and then in order to get 1 million pen you have to invest a lot of money so typically the cost curve looks something like this Okay this is the cost of production so the cost of production increases as you start producing more and more goods okay this is not the case in all situations okay in software the cost of production is actually flat there is a huge cost to create the first piece of software but then replicating it costs nothing this copy and paste okay so i'm not talking about softwares here right i'm talking about real goods Okay and so you are saying that I'm going to charge the average cost which is basically looking at this uh looking at this this is my 1 10 raised to 6 plus 1 I'm going to look at this point and I'm going to divide this by 10 raised to 6 plus 1 and then I'm going to take that then, cost and if that's the cost curve or uh, I would say Uh, we have some approximation like if we only make a uh, pens in batches of 1000 mm -hmm. and i'm going and and if the assumption is i can sell the other 999 pens mm -hmm. once they're manufactured mm -hmm. uh, i will charge you uh, the average of the costs of of pen 1 million and 1 through 1 million plus 1000 and then that's how i would approach it plus margin okay that's a pretty complicated uh approach but certainly that's one approach okay um and by the way that approach is useful in public transportation charging 2 dollar 75 cents or whatever that's how they come up with that 2 dollar 75 cents okay that's uh, exactly 
shipping is working on that okay uh, but let's go back to okay what what are the other options there is yeah one hand in the back yeah Gradient. Why would you charge me the gradient at that point? Yeah. Gradient is like a the per cost for, for one. Yeah, so that's so two dollars is what it cost me to manufacture this one million and one pen. So you want to charge me two dollars. Yeah. Okay. And that's because you want to have zero profit. If you want to have some profit, you'll probably add a little bit to two dollars. Right? Okay. So one option is look at the gradient here and I'm going to charge you exactly equal to the gradient of this point, yes. If, if you take my method and, and you make it so you're only making that one pen, they converge, urge, uh, because it'll wind up being a, a functional limit over a number and the uh, uh, costs of the difference, so you'll just get all the definition right. of the derivative. Right, yeah, that's exactly how you got the definition of derivative. Okay, so, Basically, what you are going to charge me, according to him, is the amount of, amount of money it costs you to manufacture this pen. Okay, and this is exactly how prices are decided in a lot of markets where money making is kind of prohibited and the cost curve is increasing like this. Okay, so electricity market or water supply these are the markets where profit making is kind of prohibited. You know, they don't want to make a lot of money out of these uh, essential utilities. And so there, the idea is to charge you a cost that is equal to the cost of producing that good in order to serve your demand. Okay, and let me go back to the problem of electricity market where I want to minimize the cost of producing electricity such that supply minus other demand equals to your demand. Okay, so I'm turning on these lights. And there are many lights in this room. So let's say the total demand is about one kilowatt uh, for all the lights in this room. So that's my demand, one kilowatt. And then other people may be demanding 10,000 megawatt, and then the supply will be exactly equal to 10,000 megawatt plus one kilowatt. Okay, and the question is how much should you be, how much should you be charged? And the idea is if I look at J star, which is the minimum cost with supply <coughs> equals to other demand, and then J star plus delta J star, which is the minimum cost with this constraint, okay? Then you will be essentially paying delta J star to the company, to the utility company. So this is, when you see 15 kilowatts, 15 cents per kilowatt hour in your electricity bill, it's this delta J star that you're paying. Now let me make that, yeah, you have a question. But if everyone pays a fixed delta J star, or we're winding up with the average anyway, and we have an increasing cost curve, so how do those values work? No, it's not average, so if everyone is paying uh, delta J star, then essentially you are getting, this is your cost, and this is what you are getting in total. Okay, and this will be your profit. I thought we were saying we're generating profit. Yeah, but you still need to have some profit in order to pay for all the, all the, you know, there is a cost of running, to, running this market. So there is a production cost and there is this other cost of running the entire market. So you essentially have to generate a little bit of profit in order to pay for all the AP employees and this cost is the generator's cost, mm -hmm. okay? This is not the cost of AP employees and the people who come to read your meters and all that stuff. Okay. Okay. So there is still some profit that you need to make. Now, this is, 
This is not how Apple phones are sold, okay? Apple phones, the marginal cost would be $300, but you don't pay $300 for Apple phones, you pay $600 or $700 or whatever, $900, okay? So that's, that's really the case where the profits are too high, okay? And that's the case when uh, the firms want to make a lot of profit out of a good uh, with low marginal cost. Anyway, so going back to this, uh, this problem, let me try to formalize what this delta J star is going to be. So I have a problem where I want to define J star of U that's minimize fx such that h of x is equal to u. And let's say the solution is x star u and the Lagrange multiplier is lambda star u. And I'm going to assume that all the conditions for second order sufficient conditions are satisfied for x star and lambda star. So hypothesis for second order sufficient condition is satisfied or R satisfied. It turns out that your gradient of J star of U is equal to minus lambda star of U. This is the gradient with respect to U. Okay, and this is known as sensitivity theorem. It can be zero, yeah. So we just, we're, okay. we just want to minimize some function with some constraint. Right. And we're saying that the gradient of this minimization. The, to the value, the gradient of the value with respect to these uh, variables is exactly equal to negative of the Lagrange multiplier, okay? So in the case of this electricity market, what you have is delta J star is equal to the negative of the Lagrange multiplier. Or in other words, the Lagrange multipliers are, is essentially the cost of per unit of electricity, okay? If, when you solve the electricity market problem. And you have done this twice, you have done this in uh, assignment three, when you're using manifold suboptimization to solve this problem, and then you did it in assignment one for an unconstrained problem, rather a constrained problem converted to an unconstrained problem. And there you saw that Lagrange multiplier had some meaning. And what I'm saying here is that the Lagrange multiplier is exactly the uh, or negative of Lagrange multiplier is exactly the increase in cost for serving your demand. And this is of the order of 15 cents per kilowatt hour in the case of electricity in Ohio. Yeah. Is there er, another environment besides economics where er, this problem um, shows up? Well, because in economics it Why? looks like it's only appearing to the artificial constraints placed on utilities. Is there, there a problem domain where the same thing applies where it's not so much of a, na a natural yeah. utility legislative constraint? Uh, so I think, I think probably you are under the impression that these cost functions are somehow unnatural, but they are not because these are the operating cost of generators and the operating cost of utility companies. 
well, and so I, on. The way you were conceptualizing profit, right? In that it's not uh, the marginal cost. Uh, well, the, the cost of the item um, it takes a, to uh, generate plus whatever margin I have to make. You mm -hmm. generated it in a separate way. Is there a different way of conceptualizing the problem outside of economics? So, you know, unfortunately, since I work a lot on engineering economics kind of problems, so I haven't seen it used, being used outside the context of economics. Okay. So people do sensitivity analysis when they are doing, uh, when they are investing in large infrastructure projects. Okay, so how many railroads should we have? What should, how many lanes in, the, in a road or in a highway should we have? How long of a highway should we have and so on? or how much public transportation system or what kind of public transportation system we need to have in the city. So people use sensitivity theorem in those situations uh, in order to do the planning and that's what I, I have read and I have seen. Uh, outside of economics, I haven't seen it partly because I don't read those literature. Okay, and maybe you will find some other literature where this is being used for something other than economics. Okay. But Heuristically, yeah. what we're saying is that the, the negative of the Lagrange multiplier mm -hmm. tells us at the margin, if we add one more input, here is what, this is the effect it's going to have. Right. And so that, I mean, depending on how you state your problem, that could be applied to right. any number of things. That's right. This so is known as marginal cost. And that's mean. why it's sensitivity. Right? Yes. If that's we inject yes. another unit yes. in the system, here's yes. the case. Yes. Yes, so sensitivity with respect to you, yeah. okay? And typically, when you have supply equals demand constraints, the sensitivity, the U is what you demand, okay? That's the minor change in the total demand that you make in the system. Okay, so let's say that we're in a developed neighborhood and mm -hmm. there's not been new construction for a while. Right. So at this point, um, the, there, there is no more discussion of adding on to the current load right. the grid, that grid is static. So if a new house gets built, you know, the new load gets added to the system, for that new load, yes. the U mm -hmm. includes your consumption already, right? Yes. Okay. And so it's just a, it would, it would really just be the marginal cost yes. at a higher point. Than that yes, area. it'll just be a marginal cost at a higher point. Okay. And so that will increase the cost for everyone in the society. Right. Yeah. And that has deeper implications. <laughs> right. So that's why energy conservation is important. Even though you might buy energy efficient devices, uh, you want to conserve as much energy as possible because it will bring down the cost for everyone. Okay. And the same thing happens in insurance, same thing happens in many other economic systems. Um, you, everybody, if everybody uses public transportation, the public transportation will be much better. But because people don't use public transportation, the public transportation becomes worse and worse and you see a spiraling effect where nobody wants to take public transportation because it's not that good, right? So all of that has, so the sensitivity analysis has implications in those domains as well. So uh, with uh, the sort of cost function we have there, there the profit margin of the utility for the amount of money they make for producing that mm -hmm. uh, increases, so the, on a percentage basis, would increase the more energy they produce? Yes. So in the summer, the cost for energy is much higher than in the winters, assuming that people are using gas-based heating systems. Um, so in the summer, the total demand is of the order of, like, I, I know about California because that's that market is something that I've studied. So in summer, the total demand in California is about 46 gigawatt in the peak summer. And in the winters, the demand is of the order of 30 gigawatt or something. So there is a huge jump that happens in the peak summer. And I'm talking about the peak load at the peak summer and somewhat of a peak load in the winter months. So the reason cost plus isn't used is, is because you can make more money using this method? That's right, okay. yeah. So that's why you don't want to, you, you want to control the utility so that their profits don't go out of bounds, okay? Because they can really charge a lot of money for electricity because it's an essential good for us. You know, water is an essential good. We can't live without water. So anyway, that's going into government regulations. Uh, 
So of course, regulations change the cost function and the whatever constraints and all that stuff, but uh, we don't want to get into that. But, but that is not to say that you should not know it, because many a times you will go into work in some industry, and you will be asked to do, if you become a manager level person, you will be asked to do the sensitivity analysis in order to figure out whether you should invest in project one or project two or project three and what's going to give you maximum benefits and so on. Um, so I want to give you an intuitive understanding of, not a rigorous proof, but an intuitive understanding of where this result comes from. So let's, uh, let's look at that. So I am at x star of, say, 0. And this is my x star at u. Um, and this is extremely small. So u is very small. And this is my delta x star. So I have gradient of u, j star of u is equal to gradient f at x star transpose delta x star. Actually, that's not the gradient. That's just the change in u. So that, let me write it as delta j star. OK, for very small u, the change in the cost is just the gradient multiplied by the the change in x. Okay, there will be of course smaller term norm of delta x star square, but this is negligible. Okay, what do we know about the gradient of f at x star? Well, since this is a constrained optimization problem, if you move away from that point, the gradient's always, the, the, the inner product of the gradient in any vector is going to be possible. Uh, no, I don't think, uh, you're talking about convex optimization, so optimization over a convex set. Yeah. Uh, so this may not be, I mean, we are not talking about a convex set here. You could be on curves. So then we, we right. can assume that if x star is optimal, then the gradient is zero at that point? No. So we know this. Gradient of fx star plus gradient of hx star transpose lambda star is equal to zero. Right? So I'm going to add this here, so I have gradient of minus lambda star transpose gradient of hx star multiplied by delta x star plus error, small error. What is this? So that's uh, approximately equal to h of x star at u minus h of x star. Which is equal to u. So this is equal to 0, and this is equal to u. OK, so from there, we have that delta j star is equal to minus lambda star transpose u.
okay? And that's what sensitivity theorem says. That's exactly this result. Okay, if you take the derivative with respect to u, you exactly get minus lambda star. Okay, by lambda star I mean lambda star at zero. Okay, so here I have written it as a function of u, and here it's lambda star at zero multiplied by u because u is small. Okay, of course if you want to give a rigorous proof, then you have to spend a little bit more time uh, making sure every piece of the argument is correct and all the errors are indeed small. Yes? This? So remember, x star u is at the constraint surface hx equal to u. Right? So then h of x star u is equal to u. Okay? Any further questions? Okay, so let's uh, talk about inequality constraint problems. So I want to minimize f of x such that hx equal to 0, gx is less than equal to 0. h is a function from Rn to Rm and g is a function from R n to R R. Okay, so now we need to define the set of active constraints, so A of x, that is given by j such that gj of x is equal to zero. Uh, this is something that's certainly familiar to you because we have used it in the manifold suboptimization method. So, so that is saying, what is that saying? It's saying, when we say that we have a set of constraints gx, that are greater than or that are less than or equal to zero. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that we have a set of functions that yes. we're calling g of x. Yes. And they must be less than or equal to zero. Yes. So all that is saying is that with the constraints that are active right. are ones such that every g is zero. Every Not every g. The set oh yeah, so yeah, all the those set ones j. that are active are those yeah. ones that, that are zero. The g of that function is zero. Yes. Okay. So Let's say we are looking at this uh, constraint. So this is my G1, G2, G3, G4, G5 equal to zero. So these are all zero uh, lines. And so I'm at this particular point, let's say this is my X, then my A of X is, what are the two constraints that are active? So it's two and three, okay? G1 is not active, G5 is not active, and G4 is not active at X. Okay, only G2 and G3 is active. If I am here, let's say Y, then my A of Y is just two. That's the only constraint that is active. 
And so that that says that. Well, I guess it depends upon it just, the nature of the constraints. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. That that somehow restricts your ability to move. Basically. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then I need to define regular points for this problem. So the definition goes something like this. So x is regular gradient of h1x gradient of hmx gradient of gjx for all j in ax are linearly independent Okay. And we're not, so you, you, you can speak of um, a set of x, but if we're just to try to determine if the x I'm at right now is regular. Yes. And those are all just numerical vectors, and we're trying to see yes. if the determinant is yes. zero or not. Yes. Well, not determinant, but rank. Full rank or not? Uh, okay. Of course, you you there are sets. So let's say I pick a set x equals to x greater than equal to zero, and x one plus x n is equal to whatever one. So that's a simplex. And so this set, all points are regular. Okay. You can check that all points in this particular set are regular. By, uh, by trying to show that this is linearly independent set for every value of x in the entire set. So in, this, in that case, we have one h, namely the sum yes, of all Yes, this x is my, one, yeah. And then we have one g. No, you don't have one g, you have n g's. Okay. Yeah, g, g1 to gn. Okay, so in this case, my gi of x or gj of x is actually equal to xj. Question? Yes. Yes, so in the Lagrange multiplier case, we didn't have any quality constraint, right? So all we required was these vectors were linearly independent, but now since we have inequality constraint, we need to expand the definition of regularity. However, what you note here is that you only need to consider the set of active constraints for regularity. If the constraints are not active, they don't participate in this definition of regularity. Okay. Now with this uh, definition of regularity, the uh, necessary conditions are, where do I write it? Let me write it here. KKT theorem. And the KKD theorem is I want to make sure I copy everything correctly. Okay, so I define my Lagrangian L as Fx plus lambda transpose Hx plus mu transpose Gx. 
And so my KKT theorem says x star optimal and regular implies number one, the gradient of x of L at O. There exists lambda star in R m, mu star in R r, such that <coughs> gradient x of L at x star lambda star mu star is equal to 0. mu j star is greater than equal to 0 for all j in 1 to r. mu j star is equal to 0 for all j not in ax star. And the fourth condition is, let me write it here. So fourth is D transpose second derivative of L, D is greater than or equal to zero for all D in V X star. Yes. Stopping yes. Uh, not only that. Uh, well, yes, that is true. Uh, what I'm thinking is whether the manifold suboptimization, the mu that you see in the manifold suboptimization, actually yeah, is sure similar to this mu or not. Uh, okay, I need to think about it. Maybe I'll get back to it next class. I'll, I need to think about whether the mu that you studied in manifold suboptimization is same as this mu or not. But anyway, so this is the the famous KKD conditions. Okay, these four are the KKD conditions. Typically, people don't check this because the Lagrangian could be uh, positive definite. The second derivative could be positive definite anyways. But these are the three most important KKD conditions that uh, people talk about in many papers and stuff. So we'll. We'll talk about it in the next class and I'll take any questions offline.